So what I've sketched out here is a typical ovarian cycle, also called a menstrual cycle. And this cycle goes from day one to day 28. And in the middle, we have day 14. And we're gonna start off by considering an idealized menstrual cycle. So how do we know when the menstrual cycle begins? Well, that's quite easy because we have the onset of menstruation on the first day of the menstrual cycle. And that will go on for the first five to seven days of the menstrual cycle. As the endometrium formed the previous month is discharged, or the inner lining of the endometrium formed the previous month is discharged through the vagina. So day one is the day that menstruation is first noted. And then of course, the end of the menstrual cycle will be when the menstruation occurs again at the start of the next menstrual cycle. So that will be day 28. Now, ovulation classically occurs on day 14 of the menstrual cycle. So the ovum will release, or the ovum will be released from the ovary on day 14 of the idealized menstrual cycle. Now, it's interesting that sperm can live inside the female genital tract for perhaps up to five days. So that was day seven there. That would be day nine. Then sperm can live for up to five days in the female genital tract. And certainly they can readily live for up to three days. That would take us up to day 11. So sperm can live for up to five days and certainly easily live for three days and remain in very viable numbers. When you're discussing this, it depends whether you're wanting to optimise conception or to minimise conception. Let's think about, first of all, minimising conception. So um, to minimise conception, obviously sexual intercourse shouldn't take place during this period of time. This will be the fertile period. And in addition to that, the ovum can last for about 24 hours once it's been released. 12 to 24 hours. So in theory, the period where conception could occur is if sexual intercourse, since sexual intercourse occurs between day nine and day 15. If only it were this simple. Now, of course, menstrual cycles are not consistently 28 days with ovulation occurring, occurring exactly on day 14. Now, it's true that the second half of the menstrual cycle, day 14 to day 28, does tend to be fairly consistent. So that means that if a menstrual cycle lasted for 30 days, as it could well, and the last half of the menstrual cycle was indeed 14 days, then in that 30-day menstrual cycle, ovulation would have occurred on day 16. But of course, we don't know that till the end of the month with the start of the next cycle. Conversely, the menstrual cycle one month could be 26 days. And given that it's the second half of the menstrual cycle that tends to be consistent, if it was a 26 day menstrual cycle, that means in that cycle ovulation would have occurred on day 12, which of course pushes everything back. But of course we don't know that until the next uh, menstrual period comes along. And menstrual cycles can vary really quite dramatically. So to use this as a means of contraception it is, is a complete non-starter. This is not a safe, viable means of contraception. And if you're a healthcare professional or a teacher, teach young people this, that uh, even as experienced clinicians, we're not really smart enough to work out when the safe period is. So um, certainly um, non-professionals are not going to be able to do that because we can't do it. So we can't use this as a, as a means of contraception. It does say when fertilization is more likely to occur or less likely to occur. 
but we, we can never know. So as a means of contraception, we do not teach this. But of course, people want to conceive sometimes. So to maximise the probability of conception, what sort of advice should we give people? Well, if ovulation occurs on day 14 and the sperm remain very viable inside the female genital tract for three days, then I think you can see that anything from day 11 and the ovum are going to live, the ovum lives for 12 to 24 hours after it's been produced. I think you can see that the time when conception is most likely to occur is if sexual intercourse occurs from day 11 to day 14.5. That's the time that conception is most likely to occur. And it's probable that conception is most likely to occur if the sperm are already waiting high in the fallopian tube. So the sperm will be deposited high in the vagina. The sperm will have to travel through the cervix, through the uterus, up into the fallopian tube because conception occurs high in the fallopian tube. What we should call the uterine tube, actually, bad habit. We should now call it the uterine tube. Now, the sperm probably take between, well, we don't really know, actually, probably between an hour and 12 hours to be able to swim up into the uh, high fallopian tube, but sometimes that can be aided by active muscular contractions of the cervix and the uterus. But still, the best time is going to be in that period when, when conception is most likely to occur. Now, how do we know when this time is going to be to advise couples on the best chances of conceiving in a particular ovarian cycle? Well, of course, if the cycles are regular, the regular 28 days, then ovulation is very likely to be on day 14. But of course, we can't guarantee that because the first half of the menstrual cycle particularly has a, a variable uh, time course. So there's a, bit of, um, there's a bit of probability here, a bit of what you might call luck involved. Um, some, some women are aware of a sensation that they can associate with ovulation. And if that were the case and they were to have intercourse very shortly after that, then it's reasonable that the sperm could get up into the fallopian tube in that first uh, 12 to 24 hours and, and lead to conception. That's certainly uh, viable. Uh, many women don't have a physical sensation, though, associated with ovulation. Um, sometimes in the days before ovulation, the temperature will go down a little bit and then the temperature will rise a little bit, not much more than half a degree centigrade. In fact, not even that um, 0.2 or 0.3 of a degree centigrade. So there can be a slight blip in temperature associated with ovulation. Um, that can be observed for with accurate recordings of temperature. And round about the time of ovulation and just before ovulation, there's a change in the nature of the, um, the, the mucus. There's abundant, clear, stretchy cervical mucus produced to um, facilitate the passage of sperm at round about this time as well. So sometimes um, we can educate women to recognise the changes in their mucus um, and thereby indicating at which time uh, sexual intercourse will be most likely to generate uh, conception. Now, all this process is controlled by the, the brain, actually, by the, the, um, the hypothalamus producing gonadotrophic um, releasing hormones. And that will affect the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will produce follicular stimulating hormone, which will stimulate the follicle to start developing in the first half of the menstrual cycle, causing the follicle to produce uh, estrogens from the granulosa cells. And then in the second half of the menstrual cycle, this is going to be controlled largely by the luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which is going to stimulate the production of uh, oestrogen, but lots of progesterone is produced in the second half of the menstrual cycle. So oestrogen is largely stimulating the development of the endometrium. Progesterone is maintaining the development of the endometrium in the second half of the menstrual cycle. And then when the levels of oestrogen and progesterone start to drop towards the end of the cycle, the 
endometrium is no longer maintained, there'll be vaso vasoconstriction in the endometrium and menstruation will occur. So just a little bit there about the, uh, the practical aspects of the, the ovarian or the menstrual cycle.